from the Mercy One Studio. Welcome, folks, to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We are coming to you, broadcasting from the KWKY Mercy One Studios, Iowa Catholic Radio Studios. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday. Out here in Des Moines, it is plenty rainy. Bud, what's it doing out there in Pittsburgh? Uh, we have the calm before the storm. So this, this weekend, the temps are going to drop quite a bit, and we're going to get a bunch of rain. But right now, right before the show, I was out playing soccer with my kiddos because it's, it's uh, clear skies and nice weather. Well, out here in Des Moines, I am Bo Bonner, the Director of Mission and Ministry at Mercy College of Health Sciences and the Vice President, Executive Vice President of the Newman Idea. You can visit both of those at mchs.edu and newmanidea.org. But at Pittsburgh, what are you doing out there? I'm here, the Director of the National Institute for Newman Studies. And uh, this past week we had to uh, shuffle some things around with our conference. The upside for our listeners is the talks that were given are all going to be available online at newmanstudies.org. Well, Bud, uh, I think it's it's obvious, like you said, from uh, what you guys had to do out at NINS, that people have had uh, very different lives going on with very different uh, things that they had to do. So, for instance, I said broadcasting from, but broadcasting outside. I'm uh, joining via phone. Uh, as you are as well as all of us are getting used to uh, social dis- distancing and trying to do uh, what's right by uh, the collective good. So I know for a lot of people, I mean, this is uh, nerve-wracking. This is new. Uh, it's new for all of us uh, involved at Iowa Catholic Radio, certainly for us here at The Uncommon Good, our first show since all of those declarations over in Iowa, uh, probably repeating things that people already know, uh, but all of the sort of uh, directions that have been given by the governor, uh, the directions by the bishop, um, it's it's a new world, and I'm thinking, but if I'm not mistaken, Pittsburgh has had similar things declared uh, out in your neck of the woods. Yeah, I I was a little disappointed. I thought officials here dragged their feet a little bit, and but now we are, I think it's safe to say, in a, a community spread situation. So everyone's following pretty strict measures to social distance. Um, you know, though, Bo, this morning I was thinking about. Uh, you know, with the uh, Iowa Catholic Radio, at times like this, uh, it, it's an important reminder that radio is a way that brings us together as a community that actually seeming, you know, seems to transcend uh, the kind of uh, situation that we're navigating right now. That's exactly right, folks. We're hoping that uh, in the time that you have to spend uh, inside with your family or, uh, you know, if you're telecommunicating from work or even if you're, you're driving places, but uh, in these days, hopefully, Iowa Catholic Radio can be uh, one of those voices of, of calm or uh, at least information uh, for all of you uh, who are listening and, of course, going on with our wonderful programming and trying to point out that uh, within all of the difficulties of our lives, the crosses we have to bear, Jesus Christ um, is not only within them, but uh, through those crosses uh, brings his, our lives more in conformity to his. So I know that we talk about crosses and things like this a lot as Catholics, and we all already had them before all of this happened, so I'm not trying to say anything silly like that, but certainly this is a common cross that we're all going to bear together, and hopefully Iowa Catholic Radio plays its role of making that something that we can do truly together and help each other out uh, as we we bear this cross. Yeah, I think uh, if you're looking for a way just to kind of sustain yourself spiritually during this time. I know at the end of the show, we always mention the uh, daily times of prayer uh, early in the morning and then at, at the end of the night that are broadcast here. And the great thing about radio is uh, it can go through walls. It doesn't transmit viruses. And so um, hopefully, you know, Iowa Catholic Radio is already a part of everyone's life, uh, but that it can serve an important role during, during these strange times. And, uh, you know, one thing we always do is point out that the underwriter of our show, Mercy College of Health Sciences, we want people to go to mchs.edu, especially 
if these events are making you think that, uh, you know, when we get all through this together, if uh, being one of those heroic workers on the front line is something that's calling out to you, Mercy College is certainly a place to do that, mchs.edu. I know that they have ta- uh, put all classes online pretty much like basically any college that I know of. Um, so, you know, that's absolutely the case. But, you know, we, we're still, I know from talking with the president and everything like that, we're imagining the world uh, of, of classroom work, what it will look like during and after all of this. They're hard at work. They've been, um, you know, very forthright with all of the students, keeping them in uh, the loop. So mchs.edu, but also just a pitch to say in your prayers, really keep in mind health workers who are on the front line of all of this. So we want to thank MCF, uh, Mercy College of Health Sciences for underwriting our show. But keep in your prayers all of those nurses uh, Allied Health and all of our graduates and alum who are now people who are helping on the front line of dealing with all of this. Yeah, Bill, I know we're going to get into this a bit later in the show, but uh, just an initial thought about my own gratitude for, like you said, all the healthcare workers on the front lines. And thank God for uh, persons like uh, Sister Catherine McCauley, who had the foresight to build some of the institutions that she did, and to uh, our leaders. Uh, bishops, uh, religious, and uh, lay leaders who help to sustain places like Mercy College so that the Catholic Church hopefully can be um, a light for people uh, as they're um, maintaining their health and also, you know, seeking comfort and and spiritual direction. So that's what the show's going to be about today, about how uh, in the midst of all of this, the common good is something that, of course, we talk about on the show, but how really the common good is going to be one of the things that sees us through. So, Stick around. We'll be back after this. This is The Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr talking about uh, our coronavirus and the common good. We'll be back right after this. (laughs) Folks, if you want to, uh, we have the Zip Whip line, 515-223-1150. There we go, 515-223-1150, the Zip Whip line. Uh, available for people to ask questions. There you go. Uh, so the ZipWith line's working well. <laughs> it's uh, still going. <laughs> this is how we're going to mark time now. Uh, 515-223-1150. Not only questions for the show, but if you have questions for Iowa Catholic Radio in general, please feel free to use that. 515-223-1150. 515-223-1150. The ZipWith line. We'll be back. The Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr, right after this. What is the best gift ever? Well, some might say a Catholic education, and I agree. But if you think you can't afford Catholic education, think again. Apply for CTO, and you could receive up to half your tuition for kindergarten through 12th grade. More information is online, ctoiowa.org. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Father Kirby, pastor of St. Elizabeth Parish in Carlisle, will lead a 10-day pilgrimage to the Holy Land, August 3rd to the 12th. Walk where Jesus walked in Nazareth, Mount Tabor, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, Jericho, Bethany, Bethlehem, and the Old City of Jerusalem. Learn more at crownofbethlehem.com. Crownofbethlehem.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by Corel Contractor, serving Des Moines site work constructed needs for over 60 years, and the Iowa ENT Center, expert ear, nose, and throat care for adults and children. The Iowa Catholic Radio Best Shot Golf Outing presented by Permar Security is Friday, June 12th at A.H. Blank Golf Course, 8 a.m. Shotgun Start. No matter your expertise, be part of the Iowa Catholic Radio Golf Outing presented by Permar Security. Foursomes and individuals are welcome. Join us Friday, June 12th at A.H. Blank Golf Course for the Iowa Catholic Radio Best Shot Golf Outing presented by Permar Security. Registration and information at iowacatholicradio.com. The Iowa Catholic Radio Best Shot Golf Outing presented by Permar Security. iowacatholicradio.com. Thanks to Blessman International for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Every year, Blessman International leads teams of Central Iowans to share the compassionate heart of Christ with orphans and vulnerable children in South Africa. You can learn more and sign up for a trip at blessmaninternational.org. There are millions of children that go hungry every day. Thank you to Skeffington's Formal Wear for supporting Mary's Meals. Their vision is that every child in the world should be able to receive at least one good meal every day in a place of education. Mary'sMealsUSA.org
We're back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Mark coming to you from America. Broadcasting outside the Mercy One Iowa Catholic Radio Studios. Thank you for joining us today, Bud. Like we said, um, an interesting, uh, you know, situation to find ourselves in. I don't know any other way to, to put it. So just on air, buddy, how you doing, man? Uh, we're holding up okay. There is a part of me, I have to be honest, that uh, I wish I was closer to extended family. It's time like times like these that you realize how much we lean on that support network that hopefully, you know, many of us have. But um, as things go, Rachel and I are really blessed because we, we homeschool all of our children, so their education hasn't been disrupted. And my work so far has generously been able to make it possible for me to work from home. So, you know, I've, I've been praying a lot for people who, of course, are in more uh, vulnerable situations, especially wage laborers or those who this economic downturn has, is already affecting their daily life. Yeah, I have to say the same. Uh, I, I too, wish I was a bit uh, closer to extended family, although, you know, keeping in contact with them um, here in Des Moines with lots of friends who uh, I know that we're trying to do our best to keep in touch. And uh, like you said, uh, we, we have a homeschooling co-op, so, uh, you know, the kids are now home all five days instead of uh, all but two. Uh, so in that regard, we, we've been lucky as well. Uh, and Mercy College of Health Science, of course, has been uh, fabulous. Everybody who has a, a nonprofit, so, you know, me, the Newman Idea, Iowa Catholic Radio, we, of course, uh, you know, these are going to be difficult times, and uh, I'm not going to shy away from saying that if you enjoy what's going on with Iowa Catholic Radio, think it's a vital, uh, uh, you know, part of our community. And uh, the same with the Newman Idea, that if you'd be in your generosity thinking about uh, those as well, and not only those, there's all sorts of nonprofits across uh, the Diocese of Des Moines, maybe out in Pittsburgh, where you're at, wherever you're listening, listeners, uh, you know, keep in mind the difficulty of people who don't have revenue except revenue of generosity. And uh, it's, it's not like the things that those uh, nonprofits were needed for have gone away. Uh, we're all in this together. And I guess I bring that up, Bud, because this is a good way to broach the topic uh, that, we, that we wanted to talk about today. We are uh, the show that talks about the common good, and we've thought it's been important to talk about that for a while. Um, it's one of those sort of situations where you go, well, hey, let's, let's start a show where maybe there's a topic that doesn't get as much airplay as it, it should in other you know, places. And that's not a judgment on anyone. That's just what you try to do when you're doing things like radio or ministry. You go, what's something that really could uh, benefit from getting more airtime? And so, you know, the how many ever years ago that we did this, we set out to talk about the common good and bring its relevance to different topics. I don't think in my wildest dreams I would have thought that there would have been a scenario where talking about not only the importance, uh, but the, the absolute necessity of understanding the common good would have been brought to light. I mean, it, if you read history, it's obvious that scenarios like this come and go Throughout human history, I suppose it's a showing of my naivety to think that we could live in the United States and be relatively buffeted from any difficulties where the common good would become absolutely obvious about its necessity. But here we are. Uh, there's been plenty of former generations who've lived through things like the Great Depression or World War II um, and, and, and various other smaller things. Certainly 9-11 uh, in 2001 was like this. But uh, this what we're facing with uh, the COVID-19, uh, yeah, with the coronavirus, COVID-19 sickness, and, and what is being asked of us by our public officials in order to do something about it, primarily for the sake of the week, but also for all of us, calls into stark relief what we mean by the common good. And so, but I think that that's what we wanted to try to make sure. There was nothing else really, that it was obvious what we needed to talk about today. How does the common good what does it have to tell us about how we are being asked to work together um, in the face of this difficulty we all face? Yeah, I've had conversations with folks who have heard the show, and many of them well-intentioned, but some have said to me, if you're going to do a show on Catholic radio, why not just talk about prayer and devotion and the rosary and, and theology, and to them theology means 
quote unquote spiritual matters. And I think like you're saying though, um, it's maybe sad that it, it took something like this to draw our attention back to it. But the Catholic Church has this whole rich uh, social tradition of, of Catholic social teaching. And during these times, I think especially in the last few days, we've begun to see that conversations about um, how much people get paid, like if, if families are able to support uh, themselves uh, with, with the income they earn from their jobs, uh, how we take care of and organize our health care facilities. These are matters that uh, can't really just be, be pushed to the side. And look, every culture has its strengths and its weaknesses. One thing I love about the United <clears throat> States of America is we've kind of clung to uh, religion in a way that, uh, you know, maybe in Europe you've seen like a different kind of dynamic. But uh, in America, we do prize this kind of rugged individualism, and, and that maybe in some ways has helped people to accomplish great feats because they're like, by gosh, I'm going to go and, and do this sort of thing. But that rugged individualism can sometimes have, uh, it can be a double-edged sword, and part of that is kind of fooling ourselves into thinking like we're solitary, autonomous individuals who just take care of ourselves and questions about these larger questions that I raised at the beginning, that, that those are somehow... They don't apply to me, or I don't have to be concerned about them in a certain way. Right. I think two uh, topics, two definitions, two principal parts of the common good of the Catholic social teaching that people will bring up, but again, maybe it's hard to put flesh on them until we get a scenario to talk about them. One would be solidarity, and the other would be subsidiarity. So solidarity, you know, uh, I think if you look into American history at all, maybe it's sometimes exclusively tied to unions or uh, a certain time of the past about, uh, you know, reminding them people of like songs that workers sing. But solidarity goes to the deepest heart of what the Catholic Church teaches about what society itself is about. If we can't see that there is a solidness of this idea that there's a way in which together we make something that is solid and the bonds that we make are solid, then we're not going to be able to face anything like COVID-19, war, famine, any of the things that we know human life eventually will face. We won't be able to face it unless we have solidarity. And so the question starts to mean, what does it look like in the flesh to say that we have solidarity between one another? Subsidiarity is another one. It's a you know long word, but it's where we get the idea of subsidies or subsidizing. Um, but the term subsidiarity has the connotation about, okay, so with solidarity in mind that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and that by the fact that we're all humans, we share a common brotherhood. Subsidiarity talks about the way in which we're not one collective monad, that we're not all the same thing, that there is really bifurcation and distinction. And so the question starts to be, at what level, at what level do certain responsibilities fall and certain obligations? Now, again, this can often be politicized or thought to belong to only one side of the political spectrum. And as you were saying, Bud, sometimes can be seen as a sort of theological proof text for rugged individualism. But subsidiarity, as we're going to talk about it today, really takes on uh, meat and bones, pointing out at what level should all of these different myriad uh, aspects of society uh, at what level is and whose responsibility is it and whose obligation is it to respond well to something that involves all of us. And so hopefully not just those two, but we can go uh, into all sorts of specific di- uh, directions, but I think it warrants and merits to be said. Solidarity and subsidiarity both are called for, and maybe in the United States, like you said, just as a sort of way to lean into what sort of uh, habits that we're often in Solidarity really needs to be the pitch. We are in this together, and we will deal with this together, or we won't deal with it at all. Yeah, I was reading an article about all this this morning, and the author, uh, Kelly Johnson, made the point that when we talk about the common good, it's, it's different than the greater good. So the greater good, that phrase implies that some individual's well-being should be sacrificed for the sake of a larger number. But the common good belongs to all of us, and it's common because it's individual. I mean, this is all straight from the compendium of the social doctrine of the church. And so we're all about seeking the common good, or we should be. 
Now, Bo, like we've always tried to point out on the show, that doesn't mean simplistic answers. And there's going to be there's going to be disagreements. Like obviously, um, there are areas where my own area, like my own expertise, is going to fall short. And I'm going to have to listen to those who, who disagree with me. Tough decisions are going to have to be made. But with like the COVID-19 situation, it's really it's really opened my eyes to the fact that there are some things that you just can't. Like I, this is going to maybe sound bad, and I'll unpack it a little bit. But you can't leave it up to an individual decision. So, like with this whole question of social distancing, like we're in this together, and. Uh, if, if this isn't observed on a broad level, it's not going to work. Now, hopefully, I, I, I'm hoping that the difficulties that we're going through now and the sacrifices that we're all making, that it begins to have us maybe reconsider the normal pattern of life that we established before the crisis. So I'm hoping that Americans, as maybe they're forced to stay at home, that it, it, it causes them to um, appreciate family life and the community that's there maybe in, in a way that we haven't before. Or, like, you think about something, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as an ex person, like addiction to work or workaholism. Um, I don't know if I said that right. Uh, right. But, <laughs> you know, people, when you think about health in the way that it's a public or a common good, you know, people do need to be able to, regardless of what job they work, they have to be able to have time off if they need it. Like, if they're going to make someone else sick, that has to be something that we strive to provide for people. And so for me, it's almost like a, it's a communal lit and it's kind of a time to step back and say, not simply as an individual, but as a social order, as a community, how have we organized our life together in ways that actually pressure people to make decisions that are detrimental to the common good? No, I think a good way to point this out, bud, to make it take on flesh, like you're saying, because I think you're, you're right is, okay, so solidarity, how is it that we're not going to be able to share a good like health unless we all share it together. But th- that doesn't mean that it's a collective good, that there's an individual way this happens. So someone points out um, when it comes to soap and washing your hands, you can wash your hands until the skin falls off the bones. But if other people aren't or cannot wash their hands, the good of health that would come about from washing hands is nullified. So this was being brought up when it came to the issue of hoarding when it comes to soap. So, you know, you you could have a fortress of soap solitude. You could buy enough soap to make a house out of it. But if you're the only person washing your hand, washing your hand literally becomes a worthless, frivolous exercise unless there's soap for everybody else to do this as well. Again, it's not something like pointing fingers. Uh, There's certainly... a a host of ways that all sorts of people, and I'm talking about up the chain of command, could have rolled out some of this so that we wouldn't have uh, maybe seen such the extent of impulse buying. And the problem with, of course, impulse buying and hoarding, this is now not me pointing fingers, this is sociological studies, is not only when it starts to occur, but even the threat of it will, of course, make more of it happen. Because if you hear and have good reason to think that product A is out, And that means that when it is available, that you should get it as much as you can because it might be out again. And so you have many people in the sort of supply chain world uh, when it comes to food and paper supplies pointing out that there should be plenty. Now, you know, we've all made a a big run out of it, and it makes sense because we're worried about, uh, you know, quarantining and, and sheltering in place. But they point out that there should technically be enough, but it's a hard impulse, right, uh, to tell people to go from buy whatever you want, whenever you want, and as much as you want it, and even sort of encouraging that uh, you know to buy stuff. That's kind of how um, our economy uh, seems to work uh, at its best. And then all of a sudden point out, like, why we need to, to ration. We don't like the word ration. But if anybody ever talked to grandparents that lived through World War II, we know that there becomes times when together we make a collective decision to ration things, to do things in a, in a sort of more uh, reserved, planned out way. And, you know, this doesn't have to be socialism or communism or any of the sort of big philosophical debates. What we start to point out is the common good, that we have to have a shared understanding in a solid way, so solidarity, that if person A can't wash their hands, then person B washing their hands doesn't help. If social distancing helps 
person A, it will only do that if person B through Z and etc. do the same. So in a very practical way, we're being shown that these goods like health, these goods like the economy, these goods like society and sociality and family and friends and just even infrastructure, these are all common goods. They're, they're, you know, you, you yourself use them but they're only usable if other people can use them as well and if they use them well, right? So, like, we're only going to be able to use roads if people all drive with the same uh, driving directions in mind, if if there's potholes that are filled, if you drive vehicles that don't create potholes, things like this. And this is what we have to keep in mind. God gave us the understanding of the common good to see us through what we're facing now. So this is not a sort of uh, paternalistic moment. This is a call uh, to one of the highest things that we've been called to, which is to say, not like you said, but not the greater good, but the common good, the good that we can all share Mm -hmm. if we decide individually to share it. Yeah, and I mentioned in the intro, like sort of building on what you said, though, uh, I've just been reminded of how important it is that the Catholic Church, as much as possible, has a hand in something like the the medical field um, so that uh, Christians, you know, probably a lot of future saints can uh, show the love of Christ and practice compassion and care during times like this. But uh, if I could give a little plug for you know, teachers like yourself, um, you know, places like Mercy College, so essential, because when we think about the common good in some of these discussions that we're having, I think one point that's raised that we can address this in the second half of the show, Bo, is like, is this a Trojan horse uh, for theocracy? Like, is it just a matter of, like, Catholics wanting to run the show or whatever? Um, I'm not going to pun on that one. Like, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't shed any tears if we had, a, you know, a robustly Catholic president. But uh, I, one thing that, that I've really appreciated going from evangelicalism to Catholicism is our rich tradition of natural law and the fact that there's this whole way that uh, Catholic theologians have thought through, like, well, how do people come to know the truth Uh, through natural reason, because not everyone has the same access to special revelation. I've been thinking back, though, to some of our conversations in the classroom with students who are studying to be nurses or uh, studying to uh, work in radiology or whatever, and hopefully places like Mercy College can continue to be contexts where people going into this field, even those not necessarily from coming from a Catholic background, can be given eyes to see their work in a very particular way, because I've seen, frankly, some pretty horrifying posts on social media, some really utilitarian ways of looking at things like, well, is it really a big deal, you know, if so many percentage of the elderly happen, like, doesn't this happen each year? And that's kind of like the crass utilitarian mindset that's being applied to this situation. And I feel good that we've helped to send nurses and other medical practitioners down to the field that aren't going to view their patients in those terms, but who are truly going to be compassionate, either because they're, you know, committed Catholic grounding in the sacramental life of the Church, or we just simply given them some philosophical and ethical tools uh, to work with. No, but I think that's fantastic, is the minute anyone goes, well, I only want to give, uh, you know, money to a Catholic school if it's exclusively teaching Catholics, I think you're right. Like, you know, what's the percentage likeliness that you're going to get a Catholic nurse a Catholic doctor, uh, if you're in the hospital, if we can spread the truth about the dignity of human life and we get people who are even non-Catholics to at least consider it. I mean, I would hope that they would buy it completely, but even if they consider it, even if it gives them pause before they do some of the stuff like you're saying, but the raw utilitarianism that views human suffering just as a matter of numbers, if only we can spread that enough to make people go, you know what, these are people with inherent dignity. They're never just numbers. But if we can do that, it's worth every cent that we've given to Catholic education. So even when you have Catholic schools, and I'm not going to act like all of them uniformly, but even when you have Catholic schools that maybe majority talk to non-Catholics, remember it's important that the Catholic message through natural law can do so much more than we realize. We're going to continue this uh, conversation after the break. This is The Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr, broadcasting outside the Mercy One Iowa Catholic Radio studios. Stay tuned. We'll be back right after this. Folks, uh, at this time when it's hard to 
see people in person and things like this, it's imperative to stay in touch with each other by any means that we can. And so here at Iowa Catholic Radio, it's important that we reach out to you via our social media, and we're going to keep up on that. So on the, our website, iowacatholicradio.com, you can listen, you can sign up for the newsletter. As I said before, you can donate, which in these times has become imperative because for nonprofits it's very hard for them to survive uh, things like this. So please, in your charity, if you've ever thought about giving, you can go there now, the donate button at iowacatholicradio.com. You can follow us on Facebook. Go to Facebook and search for Iowa Catholic Radio and become friends on Facebook to follow us on what's going on. And then you can also go to Twitter at IA Catholic Radio to follow us with the tweets. And uh, we try to keep up with what's going on at Iowa Catholic Radio and the diocese. This is the Uncommon Good. Like I said, Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr, we'll be back right after this. The Iowa Catholic Radio Best Shot Golf Outing presented by Permar Security is Friday, June 12th at A.H. Blank Golf Course, 8 a.m. Shotgun Start. No matter your expertise, be part of the Iowa Catholic Radio Golf Outing presented by Permar Security. Foursomes and individuals are welcome. Join us Friday, June 12th at A.H. Blank Golf Course for the Iowa Catholic Radio Best Shot Golf Outing presented by Permar Security. Registration and information at iowacatholicradio.com. The Iowa Catholic Radio Best Shot Golf Outing presented by Permar Security. iowacatholicradio.com. Thanks to Blessman International for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Every year, Blessman International leads teams of Central Iowans to share the compassionate heart of Christ with orphans and vulnerable children in South Africa. You can learn more and sign up for a trip at blessmaninternational.org. Thank you to Blackbird Investments for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Blackbird Investments form strategic alliances to create energy-efficient buildings. Blackbird Investments believes in giving buildings a new life. Blackbird Investments, doing what is challenging because it is right. Blackbirdinvest.com. Here's your forecast on Iowa Catholic Radio. We'll be in the mid-50s for the afternoon and some showers around. Looks like showers and thunderstorms rolling through tonight with our low near 50. More showers and scattered thunderstorms in upper 60s tomorrow. Weather is brought to you by Rock Valley Physical Therapy. Outstanding outpatient physical therapy and sports medicine rehabilitation with seven convenient locations in the Des Moines metro and southwest Iowa area. I'm meteorologist Steve Hamilton on Iowa Catholic Radio. There are millions of children that go hungry every day. Thank you to Skeffington's Formal Wear for supporting Mary's Meals. Their vision is that every child in the world should be able to receive at least one good meal every day in a place of education. Mary'sMealsUSA.org Support for programming of Catholic Women Now partially provided by the Des Moines Law Offices of Fred Haas. Over 30 years helping injured Iowans recover losses from accidents and work-related injuries. Fred, double D, Haas, double A, FredHaas.com Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr, joining you this Wednesday, broadcasting outside the Mercy One Iowa Catholic Radio studios. It's good to be with you. Many blessings. Uh, Bud, uh, I, I, I think you were saying, did, did you have a prayer or something that you wanted to, to do before we started back up? Uh, forgive me for garbling the message uh, on air. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, if I, I'll take some time to pull one up. I thought before we break for the final announcements at the end of the show, that we could offer a special prayer for the health of everyone and the safety of everyone that that God would show his mercy upon us. But I'll I'll, uh, pull that up as you're dropping some some truth nuggets on our listeners here. That sounds good to me. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Yeah, that sounds great. And, folks, thank you for um, being patient with us, Uh, again, trying to do our best to follow uh, guidelines. Uh, You know, so we're doing things like making sure to have social distancing, and so sometimes uh, technology-wise, we're, you know, trying to figure things out as best we can. So we're, we really do appreciate that. Um, in the last part of the show, we were talking about the common good. I think we talked quite a bit about solidarity. So, but uh, we, we want to talk about subsidiarity uh, for the, 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 this part of the show, or did you have something specific in regard with uh, the, the medical industry that we wanted to make sure to talk about before we moved on? Well, if I could uh, transition back to what I was saying about natural law, because I think this ties into solidarity and subsidiarity, Bo. But sometimes it is tough to think through some of these questions about the common good, because the fact of the matter is we live in communities where not everyone necessarily has the same convictions and um, moral outlook that we do. And so it can be tough because it's like, well, we have uh, these ideas 
uh, strongly held about who we should care for and how that care should go. And, and yet we have to navigate the kind of differences and disagreements. And that's where, uh, for myself, I look to someone like St. Benedict. And St. Benedict, uh, his name has actually been used a lot in recent years in these kinds of discussions. And there have been different various uh, books who have appealed to St. Benedict as sort of a model to follow in our times. Uh, some of those have been more helpful than others. For myself, whenever I think about following the saints, I just think about, you know, in the New Testament, St. Paul says, imitate me as I imitated Christ. And I think St. Benedict, uh, St. Joan of Arc, St. Mother uh, Teresa of Calcutta, they all give us, you know, shining models of what this looks like in particular circumstances. So I don't, I don't offer this as sort of like um, one size fits all or a quick and easy solution. But I think when you look at someone like, like St. Benedict, he stared down some very difficult circumstances in his own culture. And he could have just said, well, the culture is going off the tracks, like civilization is, is running on fumes, and uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to hole up and, and just wait for our Lord to return. But no, someone like St. Benedict, and we could point to other saints as well, was really creative in those circumstance, circumstances, and he knew he had a, that he had a call to God from God to serve others and to preach the gospel. And so uh, for us, like what I think that looks like is we don't have to wring our hands about whatever difficulties we're facing, whether that's, you know, natural circumstances caused by, you know, biological causes that we didn't expect, or just the fact that our culture as a whole seems to be embracing things that are really contrary to the gospel. We can say, I've got an important job to do. And God has called me to do a special work, whether that's in education or in medicine or preaching the gospel, being on the radio. And I'm going to do that, and I'm going to be gratuitous and sort of like, um, there's, there's a word I'm looking for, almost like, um, um, you know, like, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not going to count the cost in the sense of like, I can be radical because God's shown so much mercy to me and really just provide this shining light that, Regardless of how the culture responds, they can look to our lives and say, you know, these people are committed to, to something different, and I want to know what that's about. Yeah, um, I think maybe magnanimous is one of the words that would fit in there, that uh, we can have a greatness of soul precisely because uh, we follow one who, uh, who whose soul is uh, great enough to die for us and, and to be risen from the dead with Jesus Christ. You know, but... Uh, I think this would make sense being that you're a Newman scholar, but there at the end, um, you know, you really were channeling one of Newman's great prayers that uh, all of us have uh, essentially a part that God has chosen us to play. And even if we don't know it, um, if we just try to follow what he has set before us, if we don't find out in this life or the next one, we'll see what it was that our role, our goal, what he had in mind for us was. And so, uh, I mean, at some point, um, you know, with the second half of the show, I'm sure that if you want to talk about John Henry Newman, even if it's just that prayer, or if he himself ever had to deal with circumstances like this, um, I'd love to hear it. With Mercy College, of course, uh, Kathy McCauley uh, creating the Sisters of Mercy, the House of Mercy in Dublin, um, back when she did, uh, not only was this just because of sort of the Industrial Revolution and its difficulties, you know, in mass, which she that's one of the reasons she did it, but particularly, the sisters got known responding to cholera epidemics. And so that's really what, they, when they were known as the walking sisters going out, of course they were just looking for anyone who was down and out, anyone who, uh, you know, had lived a rough life, had got in trouble. But really, the sisters got known throughout the United, the United States, Dublin, England, the world, because they were willing to go out precisely during these epidemics and, and be there for the people who needed it most because they felt called uh, by the power of the mercy of God, the mercy of Jesus Christ. And I think to your point, Bud, one of the ways that this is uh, significant to, to see about even reaching out to the world that not only might not be with us, but might be in complete opposition to us, you know, Ireland at that time was under home rule by Britain. And so part of the difficulty of uh, just doing what Catherine McCauley did. Catherine McCauley, the founders of the Sisters of Mercy, um, you know, ended up with uh, with with wealth and money uh, because of um, actual Anglican um, uh, aristocrats she worked for that both of them actually converted to 
Catholicism by her witness at, at their deathbed. Um, but she had enough money that if she wanted to convert to sort of the Church of Ireland, which would have been the Church of England, Anglicanism, she could have lived a very, very posh, easy life. But instead, not only did she stay Catholic, she uh, used all of her wealth to create the House of Mercy. She became, um, you know, like a religious order. And by the time that uh, she had died, one of the things uh, that blew everyone's mind is the Sisters of Mercy were asked in England to create a House of Mercy on a public road. That was the first Catholic public institution allowed in England since their Reformation, because the sort of outsized influence of their witness to mercy and being willing exactly in things like the cholera plagues to go help these people uh, shined out in such a way that even former enemies asked them to come uh, be Christ's mercy for them. And so once again, I can't do this enough because, uh, you know, in, in Iowa, uh, I know there are places in the United States where it's already ramping up, but certainly we're not in the boat that, say, Italy, Spain, China, and South Korea are in yet. I just want to take this time really to praise all of those people who are doctors, but near and dear to my heart, especially nurses and the allied health, uh, all of those uh, medical workers who are going to be stretched to the limits if, if what people are saying uh, is true. And it, it goes without saying that um, it's been an honor and a privilege to teach so many of you guys and uh, to be associated with you in any way. I always joke around that no one looks at me and thinks that I'm healthy or I have anything to do with health, actually. <laughs> uh, but it's been an honor to get to teach so many of you, to be by you, to do ministry with so many of the people who are flat-out heroes and when this is all said and done, we'll be understood to be heroes. And any sort of accolades, any sort of pay raises or statues or memorials that are coming your guys' way, you deserve those and three to five times as many. Uh, so, but, but it goes back to Catherine McCauley, Venerable Catherine McCauley, Mother of the Sisters of Mercy, shows what it means to have that sort of hope magnanimity and solidarity and belief in the mercy and the power of the mercy of Christ to go out and help even former enemies uh, see through some of their darkest days. Yeah, that's awesome, Bo. And I, of course, uh, echo with a hearty amen what, what you say about healthcare workers there. With, with respect to St. John Henry Newman, my thoughts have actually been going back to uh, when he was a young man, he took a trip with his best friend and his best friend's dad to Sicily. And uh, at the end of the trip, uh, his friend Hurl Fruit and, and, and Robert Fruit, his father, decided to travel by train back to England, and that was their original plan for the trip, where Newman said uh, I, he, was, he really enjoyed Sicily, and he made a spur-of-the-moment decision to stay in Sicily longer. And as a result, um, he ended up contracting a serious illness. Uh, we think today that it was probably typhoid fever. And uh, Newman actually, though he was a young man, uh, got to the point where he thought he might die. And on the ship, he was deathly ill. And that's actually when he penned uh, his famous poem. Uh, today, it's known by the name Lead Kind of Light because it's become a hymn that's sung throughout different parts of the world. But the, the poem goes, Lead Kind of Light amidst the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see the distance seen one step enough for me. And as he was pinning that meditation, Newman thought about a sermon that he had preached right before leaving England, where he had criticized what he called willfulness, which is uh, a sort of stubbornness to say, I'm going to go my own way rather than following the will of God. And so he was convicted in that moment about his own willfulness and selfishness, and he saw that, that, that spur-of-the-moment decision to go to Sicily as, um, as, as like a mistake that he had made on his own part. But nevertheless, um, the illness he interpreted as like a chastisement or discipline from God, and he said, like, there's, um, there's a silver lining here in that God has brought me back to what's most important. And he, he was convicted or convinced that as they were selling back to England that God still had a work for him to do, It'd be another, uh, it'd be a number of years before he converted to the Roman Catholic Church, 
and of course had a huge impact on the Catholic Church in England and throughout the world. Uh, and so he didn't really know fully what, what God had prepared for him. But um, I guess just that, that example in those circumstances of how what was very difficult for Newman became a turning point for him and a metanoia or repentance uh, in his spiritual life, um, maybe that this will be an occasion of grace for us uh, during our own uh, difficult circumstances. No, I think that that's, uh, <laughs> that's absolutely beautiful, and I think considering both uh, Catherine McCauley and John Henry Newman um, and all that we are saying really brings up the, the sort of last point we wanted to hit home about reconsidering once more what we mean by subsidiarity. The willfulness thing is really interesting, Bud, because on one hand, like we said, the common good um, is not the greater good, um, and it's not like the halfway point between the greater good and individual good. It's the sort of it's the sublime way in which when we get to the point where we're making decisions in a just way, that the individual and common good begin to participate and share in one another. And, and it's hard to get there. Uh, I think anybody who acts like, you know, we just be like, yeah, man, just do the common good. What's your problem? Uh, would be seriously uh, misunderstanding what we're saying. It does take um, some sacrifice. But the idea, of course, is that that sacrifice is in your own interest as well. And so, you know, Newman talking about um, willfulness, wanting to sort of like do everything I want on the spur of the moment, that God can use even our willfulness and our mistakes for a greater good. And certainly this is the case that as bad as all of this is, I do believe that there is a way in which God is using... There, there's going to be tons of silver linings, and none of them will diminish the dark clouds, that there will be definite things that will never get back. The world will never be the same after this. But resurrection, of course, doesn't eliminate the fact that Christ died. Resurrection means that his death um, is, has been victorious and that there's, a, there's a, a, a paradox involved in it. So I know, I know with deep faith that that's ha there's something in this for even those who have to suffer the most. Do I know and see it exactly? No, but I know this, and I want all of the listeners to know this and meditate and pray on that. But when it gets down to this idea of, like, my will, the common will, what's best for all of us, this is what we mean by subsidiarity. Again, subsidiarity sometimes gets thrown out as a sort of uh, individualism. So, like, oh, yeah, solidarity is good, but as long as it doesn't impinge on individualism. But subsidiarity doesn't have the idea that, like, oh, every individual ultimately is sovereign. Subsidiarity takes uh, serious that the body mod metaphor truly does pertain to the body politic. So it's absolutely the case that, you know, your ha right hand can do all sorts of stuff that's only in the interest of the right hand that would be detrimental to the body as a whole. And so we realize, right, that there's certain uh, hierarchy in our body where we go. There are some things that are more important to guard and take care of, and there are certain things that uh, we should have a higher regard for uh, compared to other things. So the easiest one to think of is our stomachs, and Lord knows uh, I need to be listening to my own advice here. But there's all sorts of things that sound really good to your tummy tum tum and like your, your tongue and your digestive tract, that your brain knows will not be good, not only in the intermediate future, like heartburn and things like this, but also in your prolonged future. So if you could imagine that subsidiarity is just each individual part of a body doing what it thinks is best, it, it makes no sense to think about it because a body is a body and it has to be uh, subordinate to higher stuff. Your stomach should listen to your brain most times. Your brain needs to, like, relax sometimes and let your stomach say, hey, man, it's time to feast, it's Easter, or whatever. And certainly after all of this quarantine stuff is done, folks, we need to have a big party with as many people in it as possible. But uh, your, yeah, your, your, your stomach should listen to your brain, but your brain has to be mindful of everything that's going on in the stomach and everything like this. The subsidiarity works the same in a body politic. There's all sorts of stuff that you are not only responsible but obligated to decide what's best for you, what's best for your family. And there are things that it's absolutely the case that a state, municipal, federal, world government do not have the right to take away. 
things like your, you know, the the justice owed to God and religion, for instance, what how you raise your kids uh, when it comes to education, things like this. But folks, there's also things that you will never have the right or obligation to do, and a lot of these have to do with the common good that has to do with the perspective that only certain levels of rulers, I know we don't like the word, but like that's what there are, certain people with a certain obligation to assess in a common way that it's their job to do things like this. You know, it, it, it could never be up to individuals to declare quarantines uh, because that would not make sense. So I understand, especially uh, as a good American and even like uh, throwing that out as a good Oklahoman who were a rowdy bunch and, uh, when it comes to things about, like, uh, you know, leave us the heck alone, we, we kind of fall in that sort of line in most things. But the common good and subsidiarity teaches us that just that there are things that can never be taken out of your hands, there are certainly things that could never be in your hands. And some of this comes to decisions about the public good and the public health. And so uh, when it comes to solidarity and subsidiarity, um, it comes back to we are a body. We are in this together. If the right hand decides that it is more important than the left or the brain or the stomach or the foot, then the body will be at war against itself. And by definition, that is a disease and the body cannot stand. We have to understand ourselves as a body that is both solidarity, that we're in this together, but subsidiarity, that there's responsibilities I have that others don't and others have that I don't. And it is only by recognizing all of this together that we'll get through it as a healthy body. Yeah, that's great stuff, Bo. And uh, I actually, when you first started talking, a phrase jumped out to me where you said, the silver lining uh, doesn't diminish the darkness of the clouds. And one thing that we've always tried to emphasize on the show is that when we talk about hope, that can't be reduced to optimism. Some people will say, like, well, if we just had the power of positive thinking, everything would be okay. But we know from sacred scripture, we know from uh, history, that that's not necessarily like the case with God's children. And what I have in mind is something like uh, St. Paul and this thorn in the flesh. We don't know exactly what it was, but he asked God several times to take that away from him and then realized that God was using that in a, in a specific way that he said God's power was made perfect through his weakness. Or someone like Joseph in the Old Testament, his brother sell him into slavery, He's falsely accused of something he didn't do, thrown into prison. In the end, God uses all of those series of events to provide for his people. And Joseph says to his brothers, uh, when they reunite, what you intended for evil, God intended for good, or God worked to good purposes. So God's working of good purposes, and this Easter resurrection that you mentioned, like you said, it passes through the way of the cross. And so we're not guaranteed no suffering or an easy path or a bed of roses. But we do know that it's working towards a, a glorious end. Um, and I guess with that word, is it all right if I uh, offer a quick prayer for our listeners and for the situation? Absolutely. All right. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. O oh Mary, you always brighten our path as a sign of salvation and hope. We entrust ourselves to you, health of the sick, who at the cross took part in Jesus' pain while remaining steadfast in faith. O loving Mother, you know what we need, and we are confident you will provide for us as at Cana and Galilee. Intercede for us with your Son, Jesus Christ, the divine physician, for those who have fallen ill, for those who are vulnerable, and for those who have died. Intercede also for those charged with protecting the health and safety of others, and for those who are attending to the sick and seeking a cure. Help us, O Mother of divine love, to conform to the will of the Father, and to do as we are told by Jesus who took upon himself our sufferings and carried our crosses so as to lead us through the cross to the glory of the resurrection. Amen. Amen. Folks, this is the Uncommon Good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, our families, our city, our state, our nation, the entire world, the whole kit and caboodle in this time of crisis. Uh, this is the Uncommon Good. Folks, pray for each other, be good to each other, watch out for each other. We'll be back next week. <laughs> But that's a beautiful prayer. Do you mind real quick telling people what that is? I mean, uh, I, I know what it is, but uh, I want to make sure people can uh, apprise themselves of it if they get a chance. Yeah, it was uh, made available to me by the Knights of Columbus, uh, who, who put it up on their website. But it's adapted um, from a prayer of Pope Francis. So uh, I think it's a prayer that the Holy Father wrote specifically for our time. 
and that the Knights of Columbus are helping to disseminate. So that's definitely a prayer to keep in mind. Another one, folks, um, we're in the uh, the novena leading up to Our Lady of the Annunciation uh, on, uh, well, just her Annunciation, excuse me, on March 25th. Um, so there's there's different novenas. I know that like that started on the 16th, but it's never too late to ask Our Lady uh, to intercede for us uh, in these dire times. So that's one. Um, uh, there's plenty of saints that have been known to intercede for people during plagues, or St. Charles Borromeo, St. Gregory the Great, St. Rocco, the 14 Holy Helplers, uh, St. Michael. Uh, there's supposedly a St. Corona herself uh, that was from Italy that's a uh, plague saint. I myself have not researched that. That's something to consider. Um, but what are prayers that if people want to join with uh, Iowa Catholic Radio, they can do so throughout the day? Yeah, please join us in prayer. We pray the rosary daily at 5.30 a.m., 9.30 a.m., and 9.30 p.m. That 9.30 a.m. rosary is dedicated to praying for our country, so that could be a great opportunity uh, to pray uh, for protection of all of us during this time. And we also do the Angelus uh, right at 6 a.m. And then, uh, of course, folks, <laughs> things about when it comes to events are all spotty. Um, and so instead, I would direct you not only to our website to listen, if you can't um, listen on the radio, um, you can also uh, see what other events, when, of course, they start coming back, uh, join our newsletter. The other one, I, I really can't say this enough. I know it sounds like I'm begging, but uh, look, when it comes to these difficult times, nonprofits have a very rough time. Iowa Catholic Radio, I, I haven't been told this by anyone, so this is just me speaking uh, personally. If you can remember them at all, iowacatholicradio.com, there's a donate button. Um, please help us during this time uh, so that we can keep up this uh, ministry that seems tailor-made uh, to the times precisely by keeping people connected without us necessarily having to uh, you know, violate the 10-person rule. So please keep that in mind. Uh, and very much our prayers, uh, your prayers, they're going to sustain us together. Folks, please be careful. Please uh, each other in prayer, take care of each other, uh, try to contact the lonely. If you have old family members out there, remember to give them a phone call or a FaceTime. Uh, we are in this together, folks, uh, and I just want to wish all of you, uh, give you a blessing, and uh, especially pray for medical workers. This is the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr. We're out. We'll see you next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good.